then started to perform in communist contexts, like the Kulturbund in Soviet-occupied Berlin. That same year, she performed in Poland and Prague, and in the last place with Paul Robeson, covered by the local press in an article titled Two, For Whom Art Is Their Weapon. From Prague, she went home to Amsterdam. Unable to rebuild a career in Holland with Yiddish performance, Lynn and Eberhardt moved to the German Democratic Republic in 1952 with their two children. He became a central figure in East German state music and eventually a member of the parliament. He also accompanied Lynn everywhere she performed. Life wasn't easy for a Jewish Auschwitz survivor trying to make her way with Yiddish music in post-war Germany. <laughs> I, I found this in the archive. Yeah, and, man. Can we give it up for people who find shit like this in the archive? <laughs> and as you can see here, in her early years, she, this is going to sound really crass, she took odd jobs teaching German dance. Lynn's first public performance after relocating took place as part of East Germany's annual Kristallnacht commemorations. Less than a month later, she held a solo show of Yiddish music in the heart of East Berlin for the country's cultural elite. Although Lynn was best known as a singer of Yiddish in East Germany and beyond, she broadened her repertoire by learning contemporary German music. Some of it had been composed by German Jewish returnees or emigrants committed to building a socialist state, including Hans Eisler, who actually wrote the country's national anthem. Is Hekka Han in here? Everybody was like, we're going to sleep here. Everybody stand up, stand up, kick out. Yeah, sorry about that. All right, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I want to sing this in the name of one of my teachers, Dagmar Klaus, who is a very beautiful interpreter of Hans Eisler, and we love her. All right, ready? Thank you. 